Every story must have a beginning, a reference point. For the big storms of 1964, we shall use the dread warnings, the hurricane flags. Four times they flew over the American mainland in just a few weeks. And every time that they flew, WFGA television cameramen and reporters were there, whether it was Cleo, Dora, Hilda, or Isbeth. These scenes were during Cleo in South Florida, right after daylight had broken over the beaches south of Palm Beach. Cleo, a small but dangerous hurricane, sideswiped the Florida mainland, causing considerable property damage. WFGA cameramen stayed with it until it moved out to sea. Hilda was another. A storm spawned in the Caribbean, which directed its power at the coasts of Louisiana. Again, WFGA sent camera crews to the scene. Here, they filmed the rubble of La Rose, the little town where a Hilda-made tornado brought death, as well as destruction. As the hurricane moved across the low-lying coastal areas and into the yet low but higher ground upstate, cameramen and reporters moved with it. In Baton Rouge, as in other spots, they rode with the National Guard units and rescue operations, went with law enforcement authorities into the area's hardest hit. They waded water, drove through it, sailed on it to get their stories. Last, and this time least, of the 1964 hurricanes was Isbell. She fit into the here she comes, there she goes, she's gone category. A storm which raced across South Florida during the night and quickly disappeared into the Atlantic. Her hit and run tactics caused damage that, relatively anyway, was minor. The big storm story of the year was Dora. Big, plodding Dora, a powerhouse hurricane. Everywhere in her potential path, people and places made ready for the blow. WFGA cameramen reporters covered it all, the emergency meetings and planning sessions. All those things, too, which were visual, such as the securing of the rockets at Cape Kennedy, assuring as much protection as possible. The Navy, too, took hurricane precautions. Some of its planes from the North Florida bases either were flown to safer havens or were stowed away in hangars for protection against the 100-plus mile-an-hour winds. Anchor doors closed only when no space was left. Hurricane Dora also caused a great stir and changes in plans for the carriers and destroyers of the Mayport Naval Station. Orders went out for many of them to put to sea to ride out the storm. Others were tied up more securely. For the carriers in the basin, destination was the open sea. Merchant vessels, private craft, less mobile naval equipment, most of them found refuge upriver at Jacksonville, some 17 miles inland. Piers at the port of Jacksonville handled the merchant ships. Other types were at marinas or lined the waterfront. The second time this had happened in weeks, Cleo had been the first time. Travelers became hard-pressed in the late stages of storm preparation. Either passenger carriers became overloaded, were canceled out, or rerouted because of the movements of Dora off the coast. Jacksonville had never been hit head-on by a hurricane, but most persons took note of the possibility this time and took precautions. Scenes such as these took place from Cocoa to Brunswick, Georgia, 
as the erratic Dora took her time picking out a spot to hit. People laid in supplies. Before it ended, some stores were depleted of storable foods. One of the most sought commodities was dry ice. Persons who hadn't stood in line at any sort of ice house in years queued up to get whatever dry ice they could have in anticipation of the electrical failures which would accompany the storm. With freezers and refrigerators, probable victims of no power, there was a need to save perishable foods then stowed away. Nor'easters long ago had taught the beach dwellers in the Navy a primary lesson. Have sandbags ready for any oceanfront eventuality. For the sailors at Mayport, this was a muscle-aching task in the hours of the last day of waiting. Sandbags which would prove to their entire worth. The hurricane flags were up on the evening of Tuesday, September 6th. There were the first physical indications of the storm as WFGA spread its reporters from Coco to Brunswick. It was the dawning hours of the following day when our cameraman made contact with Dora as she swept in from the Atlantic. These early morning scenes from near Daytona, which escaped the full force of the hurricane winds, but had piers and seawalls battered and torn. The physical tracking of the storm then moved up the coast. The Daytona-based team keeping check on the hurricane winds as they struck and battered Flagler Beach and the surrounding area. For the cameraman, for everyone, the going on shore was rough. Waves broke across A1A, the length of the highway, and rain beat down on travelers and householders. The seas chewed away at the beaches. It was in this area that the southernmost cameraman reporter team joined the second camera unit, one which had been stationed overnight in St. Augustine in the beaches area. From this area of overlapping coverage, the initial camera duo contacting Dora rushed back to Jacksonville with the first films of the storm. Early in the day, St. Augustine itself began to take a terrific beating, but it was a prelude for what yet was to come. The wind screamed across Matanzas Bay, creating dangerous but beautiful scenes of the historic Bridge of Lions. By now, most people were boarded up and inside, but for wildlife, there was no place to go. They just braved it out. For St. Augustine, for the nation's oldest city, the screeching winds of Dora had just begun. It was to be a long day and a longer night. <laughs> Quite early in the hurricane, water began to rise on the old city streets as high tides and rains combined to boost the levels to highs not recalled by most residents of the area. Old landmarks were seen in different ways, sometimes hardly seen at all. For a while, people made their way around St. Augustine, but that suddenly ended with most traffic just that of law enforcement officers and newsmen. Late in the day, wind damage began to match that of the waves and water. By Wednesday afternoon, police and patrol were telling people not to drive unless they had to. Hurricane strength gusts were blowing cars about. Water vied with autos for the right of way on oceanfront roads. The hub of hurricane reports, the official ones, was at Jacksonville's Imason Airport. All traffic there long since secured as the storm approached. Well before Dora had blown her gusty way onto the Florida mainland, WFGA had set up a remote unit at the United States Weather Bureau at Imason. For 65 consecutive hours, reports were telecast live from there along with those from the studios and the roaming reporters equipped with two-way radio. 
Throughout the storm, the station's weather announcers teamed with the forecasters in keeping the area's viewing public informed. In metropolitan Jacksonville, the people had taken the warnings of the Weather Bureau. They had boarded up and taped up. They were ready for Dora. But there was another hazard in the high winds. Fires, many as electric wires snapped or there were electrical failures. Getting around became more difficult. Hexure Drive along the river had four feet of water over it very early. Many other roads were closed. Some shipping had anchored in the river to brave the winds and the waves. The work of trying to keep power on began early, work that was to lose to Hurricane Dora and then to continue for days afterward. By this time, WFGA was one of the few broadcast telecast facilities still on the air, and its reporters were out to keep information coming in constantly by two-way radio to film some of the footage you've seen here. They were among the few who were permitted access to and from the beaches during the height of the storm, across the marshes and low-lying roads which were flooded much of the time. Damage was beginning to become heavy, the forerunner of that which would tab Dora as one of the very big, big hurricanes of the century. At least five cameramen were kept at the beaches communities throughout most of the movement of Dora into that area the first real lashing it had ever received from full hurricane winds in the memory of man. One of the focal points of coverage was the Fletcher Junior High School Gymnasium. People had begun to flow into that designated shelter as early as Tuesday night and as the storm grew, the crowds grew. All through the hurricane, people sought refuge at Fletcher. At one point, nearly 3,000 persons had taken refuge there, the largest single group at any shelter in metropolitan Duval County. Similar ones were set up in other northeast Florida counties, Baker, Nassau, St. John's, and others, also in southeast Georgia. Many persons evacuated sections of Fernandina Beach in the extreme northeast corner of Florida, where winds and waves gave the town and ocean front a vicious pounding. As far north as Brunswick, Georgia, the WFGA cameramen and reporters covered shelters, shelters which were packed almost everywhere. For more than two days, some people made their homes in the various shelters, bringing along light bedding to keep them off the floors. Red Cross, Civil Defense, and other agencies kept tab on the refugees from Dora, helped them in their essential needs of the hour. At first, it was necessary to bring along enough food for one meal, but then the cafeterias at the school swung into action, and food aplenty was there for everyone. Thousands of meals were served. Hurricane Dora, seemed to flash its own warnings as she swept in from the sea. In slow motion, WFGA captured some of the power which was to batter the beaches, North Florida and South Georgia for the next full day. newsmen and others who braved the beachfront storm, there were dramatic events heralding the untold damage which was yet to occur in full. The seas with tides many feet above normal, battered seawalls and piers. The piers especially were susceptible up and down the entire coast. At the height of the storm, people who had hoped to stay in beachfront homes began to evacuate. However, the owners of this establishment braved the winds and the waves to remain throughout the hurricane. Early in the hurricane, power went before the winds, lines and poles were down, and the damage began to show up on homes and business houses. Hurricane Dora had hit full fury. In a way, it was beautiful to watch, 
at least it was fascinating. During the fury of Dora, one of the landmarks of the beaches crumbled before the wind and water. The Chateau restaurant right on the ocean front was undermined by floodwaters gouging out sand behind the seawall, was beaten into pieces in the dining area as wave after wave broke through the windows. Through it all, a broken-hearted owner watched the destruction, only to reopen later in what was left. For hours, the story was the same at the beaches. This way from Flagler Beach north to the Golden Isles in Brunswick, it seemed to go on and on and on. Finally, the winds began to subside at the beaches, and a flow of autos made their way eastward back across the roads which had been closed. Those aboard were to see a scene of devastation in many parts of the series of communities huddled together along the ocean. This is how it appeared to Army engineers in their first inspection. Here's how the chateau looked then. You saw the storm hit it from the inside a little while ago. Another of the beachfront restaurants fared better than the chateau, but still sustained heavy damage. Much of this came after boards and oceanfront windows had been peeled off by the strength of the storm. Hurricane Dora moved inland. Jacksonville caught the brunt of the winds. The broad St. John's River left its banks one of the rare times in the memory of old timers. Barges which had been brought up river to ride out the hurricane posed a threat downtown. Water on which they rode sloshed into the doorways of the Atlantic Coastline building adjacent to where they rode. There were similar problems elsewhere along the river as empty barges had to be partially filled with water to keep them low on the river. There was a danger of them bounding either up on the piers or the land, thus be stranded. Also a danger of breaking loose and being pushed up river by the winds. Lower sections of the downtown area of Jacksonville were flooded, water lapping over, of course, on Water Street. This was the general view at the Civic Auditorium. Boats took a fierce beating in the wind, and several were sunk. This one a reminder of the famous wrecks of the Hesperus. Damage was measured in the millions of dollars in the Jacksonville area, but one area of damage which had not been expected was that of the St. John's River floods. WFGA cameramen and reporters slopped through the exclusive Ortega Venetia area as Dora's winds and rains pounded it, came up with these unorthodox views. Homes in the Riverside area of Jacksonville took part of the pounding from river waves. This is how it looked from the normal river's edge. 
two, or the riverfront operation was that of evacuation. Cars bearing residents and friends, guardsmen and police, patrolmen and volunteers, all moved into the flooded zones to help. Boats were pressed into service, were hauled in from all parts of the town. Many of the persons living in the flooded areas welcomed help from the outside, were evacuated by the men who poured into the extensive effort to make certain that everyone was safe. Others were a bit more stubborn. They defied both high waters and winds, climbed onto tabletops or up to the second floors, and there they stayed until both waters and winds went down. WFGA became airborne just as soon as the weather would permit. It was aboard a Navy helicopter which was launched for survey work, filmed aerials for the station and the networks. Down below there was proof that it's an ill wind which blows no good. Flooded sections produced quite a haul. Here's one of the big ones. As our cameramen slogged through the waters, they found, besides people, another victim of the storm. This duck was so waterlogged that he couldn't or wouldn't fly, had a distinct disregard of that about him. About the time that WFGA crews, engineering, production, news, and management, for easing up on round-the-clock hurricane coverage, the station's flying cameraman was making an aerial assessment of damage at the beaches. These were the first movie film taken there, are quite graphic, tell their own story. On the ground, the scenes are the same, without the width of vision one gets from the air. This is the way it looked from the lifeguard tower. Things had changed. The seven seas looked this way from the inside. Plummer's Tavern Seawall took another beating as a favorite target of nor'easters, and it's scary when you gotta look at things from the wrong angle. The Jacksonville Beach Boardwalk went out in chunks this time. As the wind subsided, planes began to make flights over the beaches, including an imported one. Beach officials first learned that President Johnson was to make a tour of the beaches when Congressman Charles Bennett called his office to talk about the damage and the need for federal help. The president arrived at the Jacksonville Naval Air Station with an impressive list of senators, cabinet officials, and department heads. The group was quickly directed into waiting automobiles and the high-level rescue task force was on its way to the beaches at speeds which had the county sheriff shaking his head. The president's arrival and departure were shown live on WFGA as engineering and production crews whipped into action on short notice and with little rest since the ordeal of the hurricane itself. Unofficial or not, the word spread quickly about the president's arrival. Beach government officials weren't quite sure who was coming, whether it was the president for certain, the governor, or possibly both. Confirmation was forthcoming by patrol radio about the time that the presidential caravan left the naval air station. The police escort hardly slowed down as it reached the end of Beach Boulevard and turned south on the beach's famous First Street. The police motorcycles headed for 26th Avenue South where Mr. Johnson was scheduled first to stop. But by then, the president was pacing the group toward the seawall several blocks back. <laughs> 
president and his party paused at several shattered homes and along the broken and battered seawalls. His information came from the mayors of Jacksonville and the beach communities and from Governor Ferris Bryant. Much data already had been gathered for Mr. Johnson by the Office of Emergency Planning, but he said he wanted to see for himself. The mayors considered it a guarantee of federal help, which later was forthcoming. Besides himself, the president's party included the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, and the Surgeon General, also Florida's two senators. In typical LBJ fashion, and it was campaign time then, the president paused along the way to shake hands and to say hello to the bystanders. beaches was like the one out. Reporters and their automobiles couldn't keep up. Those who'd taken the press bus were hopelessly lost. They couldn't even catch up. Once back at the Naval Air Station, the president conferred hurriedly with Governor Bryant and then to be elected Governor-elect Hayden Burns on the problems created with the storm. Before WFGA's live cameras, he said he had made $300,000 available to start planning recovery. Then he headed again for the sleek jet which would take him to Brunswick, Georgia. An inspection tour to be repeated there, and plans there too for helping the coastal areas recover. The problems of Dora were not over. As it swept on westward, it released tons and tons of rainwater on North Florida, then doubled back and dropped more on Florida and South Georgia. The result was catastrophe. WFGA's Jacksonville and Tallahassee bureaus collaborated to cover the floods at Live Oak, floods which remained for weeks. They were triggered by about 18 inches of rain in 36 hours. These were the results. Thus, disaster had struck again and another form, but just as shattering to people and property as wind and waves. Dora, one of the worst of the century, a devastating hurricane. It will be long remembered. Its leaving will never be mourned. <laughs>